Hello Haskellings. So I'm going to go over a little bit how this do block from yesterday works. I'm going to write out how we would do this without the do block. And we would use a case statement on the lookup on the y coordinate. And then that would give us the row vector. And then if it was a just value, we would look up the row vector to find the cell. Otherwise, we're just going to return nothing. The effect of the do block is identical to the effect of this case statement. And you can see the lookup expressions are identical in both cases. A lot of people talk about monads being a programmable semicolon, but really the magic is happening in this left arrow, which binds the value on the right hand side to the name row on the left. Every monad works differently, and we have to learn how each monad works, and it's this bind for maybe monads that does the case statement for us. In all cases, within a do block, once you've bound a name, you can then subsequently use that name as though it's not a monadic value at all, like we did with row. I've just noticed on the line above the modify function, we've expanded out the tuple there, x, y, and there was no need for that. I'd like to do a bit more with the tuples in a second, but for now I'd like to generalize this map neighbors function. I'd like to make it work on any group of neighbors, whether that's the eight neighbors or the four neighbors without the diagonals. So I'm going to take in the neighbors as a parameter. We can then create a map eight neighbors function that just calls map neighbors with the eight neighbors. We can then also make a map four neighbors function and that will just be the same but without the diagonal neighbors. Once that's done, I'll put those functions into our advent of code module for future use. I'm going to do the same for the map line of sight function from part two. I hope that the do block in the get first function also makes sense to you now. We're going to simplify this code by referring to the tuples just as a single value. This will require us to have some sort of tuple addition here, so we should be able to do that. I know that we can't yet, but we're going to make it so that we can. This involves adding in an instance of the num type class for tuples. We require that each part of the tuple is also a number, which is what the type constraint num a is intended to do. To implement the num type class, we need to implement addition, which for tuples we're going to do in a pairwise fashion. We also need to implement multiplication, which we do likewise. We should also implement the other functions, but we'll see if that compiles for now. And it doesn't because we've got an a a tuple that we've specified, and you can't actually specify it like that. Instead, you actually have to have another type constraint, and you can say a is equal to b, and that's what this tilde means on the type constraint side. It means that a and b are the same type. To use this tilde notation, we have to add the type family's language extension. Another way to solve this problem is to have A and B actually as different types, both implementing the num type class. You can see it's compiling now, but we're also getting a warning that we haven't finished implementing the instance of our type class. So let's finish off the instance. We need to also implement abs for absolute value, signum from integer and negate. So let's do negate first, and we're just going to negate both values. This is the same as just doing a minus value for each of those. From integer, we'll just put it in the first one and have zero for the second one. This is perhaps like for complex numbers where the imaginary part is zero, but it's pretty arbitrary how we implement this. So we do the same for absolute value and the same for signum. 
all of which are unary functions. So it looks like we forgot to put a from integer on the x there. So that's compiling, and that means that our x0 plus x down in our map8 line of sight function is working as expected. We can now generalize this line of sight function in the same way as we did for the neighbors function. And we're going to pass in the neighbors as a parameter, meaning that we can have arbitrary line of sight functions. So we can have a map 8 line of sight function, which includes the 8 neighbors, and then also a map 4 line of sight function, which goes in the direction of just the four neighbors going horizontally and vertically. Once that's done, we're going to put these functions into our advent of code module for later reuse. It's less likely that the line of sight function will be reused, but we're definitely going to need the num instance of tuples later on. The language extensions can either be on separate lines like this, or you can separate them with commas on a single line. This module's getting quite big, so I'm going to clean it up a little bit, but I'll do that while not recording. Let's move on to today's puzzle. And this time it's about navigation. So we're going to be using tuples a bit because we are navigating in a, a two by two space. We're going to use our friendly interact function again, but this time we're not going to use parsec because the lines are quite simple to parse. It's just an initial character and then a number. We're going to have to keep track of which direction we're facing. And this can be one of the four cardinal directions, north, east, south, or west. So let's make a function that can map one of the letters representing our cardinal directions to a unit vector in that direction. We're going to use vectors like this to represent which direction we're facing, and also for movement in those directions. Our orientation can change by doing left and right turns. So let's write a function that can rotate us left or right. The Khan Academy has a great explanation of this, and it shows that the new x value will be the negative of the previous y value, and the new y value will simply be the old x value. We can then write a function that can perform multiple rotations quite simply. We start by noticing that rotating zero times does nothing. And then we can implement rotating by n times by rotating once and then rotating n minus one times. We use mod four just in case n is negative and to make sure we rotate no more than three times. Let's write the function that's going to do the moving now, and we call it m for moving. And it'll take the existing state, and then the string coming from the f function, and give us back a new state. Let's write a helper function, m prime, and it's going to take in that command character, and then we'll read in the argument to that command as an integer m prime's also going to have the same form as m. So it'll take a state, which is going to be our coordinates and our direction that we're facing. And it'll also take in the command character and then the argument, and then it should return us back the resulting state. We're going to use pattern matching to match each of these commands one by one. So the first we're going to do is f for forward. And actually, we don't need to expand out these tuples because we have a num instance for our tuple. And we can then multiply the direction we're facing by the argument n and add that to our position. Okay, f is still outputting just the list that we're getting given, so let's fill out the f function a little bit. Let's start by just making it do one step from the initial conditions, which is a position of 0, 0, and 
facing east. We're getting an error because we're actually not allowed to multiply an integer with the tuple directly. So let's create a new function that lets us do that. Let's call it star dollar for scalar multiplication. It'll take an integer and a tuple and return us another tuple. It's simply going to multiply n by each of x and y in the tuple. Now that we have scalar multiplication, let's use that there. The compiler's not happy because m is expecting a string, not a list of strings. So let's just grab the head of the list for now. And our program is compiling, but it's crashing because we haven't yet finished the m prime function. So let's move on to the commands that change direction. So we can start with the l command, and it's going to take in a value which uh, we've already checked, and it can be one of 90, 180, or 270. So we're going to use our rotn function on our direction vector, and we're going to divide by 90 for the number of times we're going to rotate by 90 degrees. Doing the r command is now actually quite simple because we can make it just do exactly the same as the l command, except using a negative argument. The rest of our commands will actually just specify a cardinal direction. We already have our dir function, which can give us a unit vector in any cardinal direction. So we can multiply that direction by n to give us the amount that we have to move. The last thing left to do is use fold to run m over all of the elements of our input list x's. We could simply calculate the Manhattan distance from here, but let's write a function to do that. It's just going to need to take the absolute value of x and y and add them together. And that should be our answer. So let's check it. And we have our first gold star. The second part is not any more difficult. It's just a slightly different set of instructions. So let's copy our file across and get to it. Our direction vector we're going to now use as our waypoint or velocity vector. So let's put in the initial conditions of that. Our forward command doesn't change, and neither does our left or right commands. But the cardinal direction commands will now affect our waypoint, or our velocity. And it should be as simple as that, so let's check that answer. And we have our second gold star for today. So as always, happy Haskelling.